Yes, OK. Yes. Yeah. Good. Um, so I'm Doug Sandy. I'm chief architect of the Hyperskill team within Artisan Embedded Technologies. Uh, the, for those of you who aren't familiar with Artisan, we are a leading supplier of power solutions for everything from consumer devices all the way up to, obviously, data center uh, devices as well. Um, throughout my career, I've been um, uh, involved in, in uh, two main things. Uh, one is about uh, half of my career I've been in technology office of uh, various companies. And I have also, through that, been involved in helping build open ecosystems. So it's kind of with, with that background and, and interest level that I'm coming with this presentation. I'm not going to be presenting um, new groundbreaking uh, answers to questions, but uh, really uh, we have some questions within Artisan that we think are appropriate for the, com uh, the community to be looking at. And we're looking for, for uh, other participants who are interested in helping answer some of these same questions with us. So um, first slide. Great. This is that, by the way, is a very special slide uh, uh, wipe technique that we get to look at today. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, in my, the abstract for this talk, uh, really what we see is, is uh, highlighted in that red bar there. Uh, next generation server net and networking architectures combined with increasing demand for data center operational and capital efficiencies put extreme pressure on continued improvement of the rack power subsystem. Okay. Um, actually, before I go to the next slide, I'd be interested, I shared a little about, a bit about me. Um, who out there is, is a, a designer of power supplies or power, power uh, solutions? Okay. Who is involved in integration of power solutions, like at the rack level? Okay, a few integrators. And how about users of power supplies within, okay, a few users, good. And who is maybe in the wrong room and just realizing it? <laughs> okay. You don't have to raise your hand. Uh, okay, let's go to the next slide. I like starting with trends. Now, this is part of my, my um, technology office heritage. Um, I like looking at trends because they tell us where things are probably going. Right? You can't predict the future, but you can get a pretty good idea of where things are going. The first trend is, is Moore's Law. We're all familiar with it. Uh, Gordon Moore stated that, that, um, that the number of transistors that can be economically produced, I'm getting whiplash here, <laughs> economically produced in, in a, a piece of silicon is going to double you know, roughly every two years. Okay. Uh, the consensus is out. Moore's law is dead. Right? Um, and <clears throat> this doesn't mean that we can't get further improvements in semiconductor die shrinks. It just means the economics around it have fallen apart. So what we can expect is that the server chip manufacturers that have relied upon ever smaller transistor sizes to fuel performance improvements over time, they're going to have a harder time doing that. That means two things from a server chip perspective. Okay. Number one, uh, you can probably expect more chips to be added to the servers, which is going to be, mean higher power, okay. higher power per server chip. You can also probably expect some specialized instructions to be added to try to offset that. But we believe the general trend will be processor chips and servers in general are going to start consuming more power. Okay. Next slide. Okay, the second major trend, and it's related because the processor performance curve is not going to continue at the same trajectory most likely, is adjunct processors are making their, their uh, way to the scene. So uh, GP, GPUs have been one area where we see adjunct processing, but also FPGAs, where we're going to see a, a whole new series of, of uh, adjunct processors. And while they, they do improve the performance of the server, they come at the expense of additional power for that server. Because if you add an adjunct processor, the power per server then goes up. So the bottom line is we expect the power per server to go up. Now what does this mean for us? Let's 
Next slide. OK. So this map shows different scenarios. Let's assume that the power per server increases. Okay. And we have a decision point. Do we want to keep the power per rack the same? Right? That's the top, um, top path. The bottom path is, do we want to increase the maximum power per rack? Both of those have challenges. Both have advantages and disadvantages. And I'm not going to suggest that there's a uniform answer for the industry. I think it's going to be vary by operator and probably vary by installation. But we can see if we keep the maximum rack power the same, that means you're going to have to have fewer servers per rack. Right? If each server costs you know, more power to run, it's fewer servers per rack. And in order to, to make your performance curve of the data center, the capacity curve of the data center, keep on the same trajectory, you're going to need more racks, right? Because fewer servers per rack, you just need more racks to do that. So that, that creates rack sprawl. The, the bottom one is you increase the rack, um, rack power, but now you've got cooling problems to deal with and additional rack power density challenges. So that might not work for, for people who are trying to keep you know, free air cooling um, and no no heat exchangers within their system. So um, you can see this touches not just the power within the rack, but very quickly impacts the operational models of the data center. Right? And that's why I think it's exciting to talk about this in this forum. Let's go to the next slide. Now here's some of the questions we have to ask. Right? If, if we have a, a, a change coming, an inflection point coming in how we're doing power, it makes sense to ask the question of, well, what does open rack 3.0 power look like, right? Maybe it's not an incremental change. So one of the questions we have is, you know, what about, are there ways to reduce stranded power within the rack? For those of you who don't know that term, stranded power is power that the capacity is there in the rack, but you can't count it on it uh, for use by your IT equipment because it's there for purposes like redundancy or you've over-provisioned the supply just in case you hit a power peak, right? Um, so in this particular example, you see uh, uh, three PSUs across the top, three BBUs along the bottom. Uh, one third of that is there for redundancy, or you've got about 50% of, of, of the power, 50% um, stranded power in that, that uh, rack. Um, by reducing stranded power, you can dramatically reduce the, the cost of your power infrastructure. So that's the first question. Um, Next, um, you know, this has already come up, you know, improving efficiency. You know? uh, and, you know, better efficiency is always great, right? I mean, as long as it doesn't come at extra cost, as long as it doesn't um, push on other design parameters that you're trying to balance. And uh, if in this, this future of rack power, we're actually looking at increasing the power density of the shelf. Okay, we might have a challenge of, of balancing power, higher power density and higher power efficiency at the time. So um, as a general rule, if you're pushing the highest power density within a shelf, um, you're, you're going to have to give some on power efficiency. Likewise, if you're pushing the highest energy efficiency or power efficiency in your PSUs, you're going to have to give some on your density. Okay. So this is another area where, you know, again, the operational models come into play. Which is, which is the most important factor? Right? As power suppliers, we can, we can tune this dial, turn the dial any direction that makes sense. But um, you know, we're, we're going to have to look at that. Uh, next slide. OK. Um, Along with power density, you know, we want to probably use as much rack space as we possibly can uh, for, for this. Uh, so this is by making a larger power station. You can reduce your volumetric density of power, and then you can push up your efficiency along with your, your capacity within the power shelf. But there are other trade-offs, like uh, this, uh, this particular shelf, the, the depth of that shelf was, was chosen so that there's enough cable bend radius. For, for the shelf, right? Um, so again, more, more trade-offs. Uh, next slide. 
this one, um, can we utilize the stored energy in other ways? There's, there are, uh, there's local energy storage within the shelf. It's there primarily to, uh, to hold up the system uh, in the, the event of catastrophic input feed failure, right? So you're, you're waiting for your diesel generators to come up. You hold up the power using the, the battery backup. The diesel generators come up, and the batteries start charging again. So it's, it's just the fail-safe there. But if you have the batteries in there with some changes to the system, you can, you can use that spare battery capacity potentially to, to do things like peak shaving, right? Um, not a new concept, um, but not one that's currently imp implemented. And there, there are trade-offs with this. Um, it does unlock some of the, potentially unlock some of the stranded power that you might have in over-provisioning of your PSUs, but it has implications to the life of the batteries that were, are within the, uh, the BBUs, right? And how often will power peaks occur? You know, again, another discussion um, that's, that's important to have and shouldn't be made unilaterally. Okay, and certainly increases the, the system complexity as well. Okay, so next slide. Okay, um, vendor interoperability. This one is, um, I like saying that, that um, making interoperability simple is really hard. Okay, that's the, the crux of this slide. But, you know, interoperability, if greater interoperability in an ecosystem generally is a win for everyone. Um, but getting there is really hard. Right now, the, the level of interoperability that we have within the open rack community really is at the rack level. Right? You wouldn't expect to, to uh, get a rack from, from one integrator or one, one vendor and um, put in a, a, a bus bar system and a power shelf from two different vendors. Right? And I think those that are, are in the integration space recognize how difficult it is to take this, this uh, um, multiple vendors and make them, them work together. Now, this community has done a great job at moving the ball forward. Right? I think we're, we're, this, this uh, open rack is really a tremendous platform for, uh, for innovation in the, the hyperscale and data center space. The question is, does it make sense to start looking at interoperability at the lower levels. Can, can we make a bus bar from anyone work with a rack from anyone else? Can we, um, can we make a power station from someone work with PSUs from someone else? And as we get down to that level, you know, can we make PSUs work with someone else's BBUs, right? And at every step along the way, there's, there may be ecosystem benefits, but there's also challenges for this group of people here, right? Uh, because, again, interoperability, making it simple, is really hard. Okay, last slide, I think. Okay, so, you know, those were the, the, some of the, the topics that we see at Artisan that we probably need to, to discuss. I mean, the management also came up, you know, what is the right schema for this, and what, what's the right... Um, method of managing the shelf. What features and functions do we need to expose to management? Um, that's a, another topic that I think we need to cover. But basically, I think the challenge is, is before us, the call to action. Uh, I think the time is now to start wrestling with some of these questions. Um, while, while Open Rack 2.0 is, is uh, enjoying a, a long and stable, healthy life, uh, we can we can uh, answer some of these other questions in the background. So, um, I let's do one more slide here. Actually, okay. I do have my contact information uh, in the slide deck. If you want to ping me, you know, send me an email. Um, I'm happy to answer. You know, we've spoken about how do we get a community discussion going on this topic. Um, so you can uh, approach. Uh, the the uh, work group leaders on that also, um, but you know, we think the time is now to kick off the discussion. And yeah, and we're not, obviously probably not going to have enough time to resolve all that today yes. in the next five minutes or so. Um, but that's definitely uh, you know if there's some interest in kind of taking on this topic, right? We can definitely spend a lot more time on the on the next you know engineering workshop, right? right. Kind of really taking a, a deeper look into these trends 
and uh, you know, kind of seeing where we want to go from here. So um, if you definitely got some interest in kind of discussing in more detail the, the questions that uh, that Doug's bringing up, um, you know, let let us know, and we can we can set that up so we have a little bit more time to discuss it in a, uh, a little bit more depth than what we've got right yeah. now. So uh, we have some time for questions yeah, and discussion we got a now. Yeah, few so. minutes right now. Yeah. So, so let me turn that back. The question was, are, am I still planning on using the PM bus interface for the PSUs within the shell? And I guess I would ask the question to the community, you know, what is the right interface for the PSUs within the PowerShell? Right? I'm, I'm not proposing a solution today. I'm just saying these are the things. So it sounds like that's a topic, right? Is that that's of interest? Is to look at the communications between the PSUs and the and the power station itself. Um, so. And between the power station. Yeah, and between the power station and the DSIM or the rack management. Yeah. So I guess I would envision and and um, that at least from the power station upward, um, there's going we're going to have to support whatever the facility operator requires. I do think uh, Redfish is gaining a lot of traction, um, and we may need to, to integrate discussions with, with uh, DMTF in terms of how we do that upper layer. Um, in terms of the lower layer, uh, I think that depends on you know, what level of interoperability we're, we're shooting for also. Okay. Yeah? I got a question about uh, what's the size Let's of use the power microphone power. so that they can, they can hear it. So what's the size of the power blocks that you see the, the PSU is running at going forward? Okay. Maybe we, we've got two and a half kilowatt, three kilowatt, 3.3 kilowatt, uh, you know, keep going. Where, where is the break point as an architect? Yeah. Um, that's an excellent question. I, I certainly see there's two things that, that dictate that, right? There's how many power blocks are there in the shelf, right? And personally, I believe, you know, we need to have more power blocks within the shelf. Um, as a general rule, because that, that reduces the, the amount of um, stranded capacity that we have in there. In terms of, of the power capacity within, uh, within those um, power modules, you know, um, I would expect you know, we're going to need to, it, we're gonna need to have a roadmap on these things that probably increases, uh, I'm going to give you a broad range, um, be, between 15 to 50 percent every couple of years. Um, and hopefully closer to the 15 percent, right? I mean, 50 percent, uh, um, there might be an initial uh, stair step uh, in terms of the, the power, power uh, uh, bump. I think the, the operators really answer that question, though, because it, it's in their, it's their operational deployment model that, that dictates that. I mean, it's sort of the merge between the, what the technology can do and the operational models that are being So it kind of gets into the chicken and egg, though, because on the IT side, they're you know, traditionally you've got the power in the server, and so whatever the server dictates is what the power, power supply in the server would be. Now we move into no man's land, where the power is distributed into or aggregated into a shelf level, which the uh, infrastructure guys aren't touching, and then the IT guys aren't touching. So now it's left up to the architects of well, the power systems. And that's why we're posing the question to this community, because here, you know, we can't solve this in a vacuum, right? The, the operators need to, to be able to, to speak up to what their operational models are. If we, if we for instance, let's say we, we uh, design a power shelf that can do, you know, with all the modules in it, can do um, 100 kilowatts. Okay, so now you can have a 100 kilowatt rack. Yeah, you know, score for, for the power guys, right? <laughs> okay, but it doesn't really work well if it requires you know, massive amounts of, of HVAC cooling in the facility and liquid to the, the power shelf or who knows what, and the operators don't want to do that, right? Uh, so that's why I think you know, that's the value of open communities is, is we get to discuss that here, you know, and, and I think we just need to, to propose and we bring as, as power supply designers, we kind of know what the roadmap for that is. As, the operators kind of know their roadmap for being cooling capacity. So. so, I mean, this kind of leads into the discussion of, you know, what, what should we be talking about as a community? 
and it brings about the really the need to have a working session that incorporates not just the power, not just the rack, the facilities, the cooling. It brings in the IT space as well because of the uh, different types of computing that they're using and the demand for the power so that we work together as a integrated group. Right now we're still fragmented where power is working on power, facility infrastructure is working on facility infrastructure, and then IT and storage are all doing their own thing, which makes it very challenging for those of us in the power domain that's uh, in, in this no man's land. So yes. I would suggest that that's an, a great topic for okay. the OCP. Super. Yes, thank you for a very good explanation. It's uh, I tried to <clears throat> change the questions of the previous person because you are a presenter of industry from one of the companies who is doing some efficient power supply in the world. Yeah, and you know generally it's a requirement between 12 and 14 uh, 15, 14 kilowatts per rack, and only you as an expert who is now a company base and so on, can recommend to community to focus it to some particular size of the power supply. Because you know, in which modes, for example, Infineon, Moffat, working so fine. And only you can give a very brilliant advice to the community, hey guys, need to focus on five per two kilowatts supplier. It's much more valuable. Please split it everything for the two power zone instead of one because this is efficient from the cost standpoint and from the efficiency because everybody in that room, customers, suppliers and so on, really to pay for 1% efficiency what he in the past. So much pay because electricity one of the biggest expense. And only you and component manufacturers can help us to, to take a more efficient power supply and you try to listen from us we are like to listen from you <laughs> so so i i absolutely agree that that those of us that are in power supply design we understand the the nuances and the the challenges associated with power supply designs and and as participants in this in this forum you know that's that's what artisan and and the other power supply uh, developers bring and we certainly you know I, I welcome the discussion as a, as a place where we can say, hey, you know, if, if we want to get another half percent out of, uh, of efficiency out of the, the, the supply, this is what it means, right, in terms of, of uh, you know, relative complexity change or density or whatever. At the same time, um, we, don't, you know, we don't design in a vacuum either, right? There's requirements. There's, there's the server trends. There's a, the storage trends. And... And there's the operational trends, right? So um, I think, you know, I've, I've designed in a vacuum before, and I'm, I'm, I've designed in, in uh, open forums before, and I really believe in, in the, the strength of, of open, open communities for developing industry, you know, industry ecosystems. So. Super, Doug. I appreciate that. Um, so we're, we're out of time. So okay. thanks, thanks, Doug. Appreciate Thank you. Thank you all. Very much. Thanks.